throng of bearded men in sad colored garments and gray steeple crowned hats intermixed with women, some wearing hoods and others bareheaded, was assembled in front of a wooden edifice, the door of which was heavily timbered with oak and studded with iron spikes. The founders of a new colony have invariably recognized it among the earliest practical necessities to allot a portion of the virgin soil as the site of a prison. Certain it is that, some 15 or 20 years after the settlement of the town, the wooden jail was already marked with weather stains and other indications of age, which gave yet a darker aspect to its beetle browed and gloomy front. The rust on the ponderous ironwork of its oaken door looks more antique than anything else in the new world. Like all that pertains to crime, they seem never to have known a youthful era. Before this ugly edifice, and between it and the wheel track of the street, was a grass plot, much overgrown with burdock, pigweed, apple peru, and such unsightly vegetation, which evidently found something congenial in the soil that had so early borne the black flower of civilized society, a prison. The grass plot before the jail was occupied by the inhabitants of Boston, all with their eyes intently fastened on the iron-clamped oaken door. The door of the jail being flung open from within, there appeared the town beetle. He laid his right hand upon the shoulder of a young woman, whom he thus drew forward until she repelled him, by an action marked with natural dignity, and stepped into the open air. She bore in her arms a child, winked and turned aside its little face in the too vivid light of day. On the breast of her gown appeared the letter A, and never had Hester Prynne appeared more ladylike, an object of divine maternity. We have as yet hardly spoken of the infant, her Pearl, so had Hester called her. She named the infant Pearl as being of great price, purchased with all she had, her mother's only treasure. The infant was worthy to have been brought forth to Eden. However, the warfare of Hester's spirit was perpetuated in Pearl. One could recognize Hester's wild, desperate, defiant mood, the flightiness of her temper, and even some of the very cloud shapes of gloom and despondency that had brooded in her heart. After multiple attempts of discipline, Hester was ultimately compelled to stand aside and permit the child to be swayed by her own impulses. An imp of evil, Pearl was born an outcast of the infantile world. With nothing more than instinct, it seemed, did Pearl come to recognize this, but never sought to make acquaintance. One peculiarity of the child's deportment is that the first thing that she came to notice was, oh, shall we say it, 
The scarlet letter on Hester's bosom. Once this freakish, elvish cast came into the child's eyes, Hester could not see her own miniature reflection in the small mirror of Pearl's eye, but a fiend-like face, full of smiling malice. Many a time afterwards had Hester been tortured by the same illusion. On occasion, Hester would cry out, asking who Pearl was. Excited, Pearl would exclaim that she was her own little Pearl. Hester would deny, asking who her father was, and Pearl would implore her mother to tell. But Hester could not resolve the theory, being herself in a dismal labyrinth of doubt. Lo, the scarlet letter which Hester wears, ye have all shuddered at it. Wherever her walk had been, they had cast the lurid gleam of awe and repugnance around her. But there stood one amongst you, at whose brand of sin and infamy ye have not shuddered. <laughs> the law we broke! God knows it! He's merciful! Praise be his name! His name be done! Farewell! Get out of my face. <laughs> 